le député de Lac-Saint-Louis. Merci, Madame la Présidente. C'est un débat intéressant aujourd'hui, je crois. <rire> euh, on apprend beaucoup de choses. Euh, J'aimerais qu'on commence en, en discutant un peu de la nature de, de la technologie, Madame la Présidente, si vous me le permettez. I'd like to begin by speaking briefly about technology. Bill C-30 is fundamentally about technology, very complex and rapidly evolving technology that we use daily, but that we don't always fully understand. However, Canadians are beginning to understand that digital communications technology and its associated everyday practical applications like email, the internet, and hands-free communications through portable devices like smartphones is eroding individual privacy. And there have been two distinct reactions to this fact. On the one hand, there are those who say this is disconcerting, we need to act to prevent further erosion of privacy in this brave new world of electronic communications. On the other hand, there are those who say, get used to it, there's nothing you can do, learn to live with this new way of being and communicating. In the end, no one really cares about the details of your private life. We're all in the same boat. Let go of your concerns, adjust and adapt. The latter view will strike someone who has been refused a job because his or her careless and sophomoric Facebook entry years ago uh, was refused a job because of this, this entry. They would strike that person as patently naive to think that we should just learn to live with, uh, with, the, new, uh, uh, with the new breach of uh, privacy, the, the breaches of privacy. Allow me to digress to talk about the inherent nature of technology. Uh, this understanding is based on my reading many years ago of a book by a famous Canadian political philosopher, George Grant. Um, the book was entitled Technology and Justice. What I took from that book is that technology is not neutral. Many will say this is obvious, that this is a commonplace. Technology can be used for the good, or it can be enlisted for less noble ends. Uh, for example, nuclear technology can be used for medical diagnosis and energy production to supply uh, or to supply uh, uh, hospitals, homes, and businesses with power, or it can be used for mutually destructive war. I think we all get this. I think that's obvious to all of us. But Grant's argument goes a bit deeper. Technology is not neutral um, in the sense that it is not simply developed to satisfy a curiosity or to be left on the shelf. We're not talking about pure research, which is often about scientists playing with ideas and discovering the unexpected simply to satisfy their curiosity. I think, Madam Speaker, if you speak to a, a, a theoretical physicist, that's what, uh, that's what occupies his or her day, and it's simply the exploration of ideas, the, the playing with ideas for the sake of it, and then something drops out of it uh, unexpectedly. We feel compelled to use technology once we have it. In fact, that is why we develop it in the first place, to fashion our reality, to fashion our environment, to suit our practical needs and interests. Now, obviously, in developing technology, most of us feel that our goal is a noble one. Even when we drift into using technology for questionable or downright destructive ends, in retrospect, technology is meant to be used. It's intended to be used to manipulate or control our reality for our own self-interest as human beings, for our benefit as human beings. Whether we're talking about medical treatment to make people healthy or to transform the Alberta oil sands into profit and uh, thus uh, benefit our, our balance of trade. Let's look at computer technology. Computers allow for compiling databases. This was one of their first uses. Computerized databases are useful. But once we have the capability to do so, as some lament, we want to catalog everything. We want to collect information, sometimes just for the sake of it, until we figure out what to do with that data. We don't need to go far to see how databases are used, sometimes quite aggressively, to attain a specific goal. Political parties use databases to contact voters, build support, and raise money. But these databases have the capacity to be used in an un underhanded way, as we are seeing emerge in the current conservative robocall scandal. But that is not the main point of my discussion. As in the case with society as a whole, technology has changed policing. Policing used to simply be about catching lawbreakers or first deterring crime uh, by the fact of a police presence like a cop on the beat. 
But now in the words of David Lyon, a world-leading surveillance studies scholar, as with database marketing, policing systems are symptomatic of broader trends. In this case, the trend is toward attempting prediction and preemption of behaviors and of a shift to what is called actuarial justice, in which communications of knowledge about probabilities play a greatly increased role in, its, in the assessments of risk. I think what, what the above quote means is that modern policing is more and more about data collection, necessarily through surveillance and building profiles through data collection, and then tracking individuals who could theoretically pose a problem for public security. Now that is all well and good. We want to prevent crime. We want the police to be proactive and, and vigilant in, in preventing crime. But the new technologically sophisticated crime prevention tools also come with side effects, some of which we may not want to live with or otherwise want to constrain, constrain through rigorous, effective and wise laws, or by standing up to hold the government to account when it introduces legislation that is rooted in this human fascination with the power and possibilities of technology in allowing us to control our, our surroundings. Proponents of greater state surveillance say you have nothing to be worried about if you aren't doing anything wrong. But that attitude, apart from sounding like it comes from Big Brother's two-way television monitor, ignores the fact that individuals can suffer the consequences of surveillance even if they have, nothing, have done nothing wrong. Think of Maher Arar. Think of others who have been unjustly detained at the border or at airports and who are completely innocent. Surveillance technologies placed them in the wrong category, under the wrong tab, in the Big Brother database, even though they had done nothing, even though they had nothing to hide. This is where modern surveillance technology can lead us, to, if we are not careful, to constrain and control it through good laws that protect our charter rights to privacy and our right to live in a healthy, free-thinking democracy. These new internet surveillance technologies can catch the innocent in its ever-expanding web. Christopher Parsons at the University of Victoria has described how this can happen. Consider the following scenario, and I'll quote, because I, quite frankly, I don't think anyone could have put it better. In a college university, in college university or your private life, you communicate with individuals who once did or presently do agitate peacefully against certain state behavior. You might be aware of those individuals' behavior, or perhaps you know nothing about it. In any case, you engage in discussions with those people online, perhaps on a website where topics include opposition to certain state behavior, or maybe in the comments section of a newspaper article, or perhaps in some other format. If the police are interested in tracking those individuals who are invested in an issue, for instance, legalizing legalization of marijuana or protesting against federal decisions concerning Sri Lankan immigrants, and with whom you've been talking, your subscriber records could be requested along with those of all the other individuals who participated in the online discussion. Let's assume that you do not support opposing an official government position and aren't necessarily of real interest to authorities. Regardless, the police might request your subscriber data and that of everyone else engaged in these discussions. No warrant is required for authorities to request and receive this information. They would get the same information for every participant of the discussion. With this information, they can turn to the company that provided the email account as well as contact the ISP who pro provisioned the IP address at the specific time you posted your message. With information from the email provider, they might be able to uh, definitely identify the ISP that you use and from that your name, address and so forth. You will never know you were added to such a database because the service provider could not legally disclose that the information has been released. And as a result, your life prospects may change for legally associating and speaking with those who were similarly engaged in legal speech and discussion. Now, some will say that, that uh, and I, that's the end of my quote, Madam Speaker, S some will say that they, the police would never have, uh, or, or some people would say they would never have these kinds of discussions online, only over the phone. Well, Bill C-30's provisions allowing the state to obtain five, six pieces of, of subscriber information without a warrant still leaves you, an, a law-abiding citizen, vulnerable. Say that you have a cell phone and you're downtown shopping. You happen to walk by a protest, say a G20 protest, and you stop with your friend to observe this because, you know, it's something that you don't see every day. Or you visited an Occupy camp or were a passive spectator in the 2011 Vancouver hockey riot. Your cell phone's identity may be captured by police. 
This can happen because police can use a technology known in the U.S. as a Stingray IMSI catcher, which is a piece of equipment that emulates a cell phone tower and captures IMSI numbers within several kilometers of the catcher. IMSI means International Mobile Subscriber Identity Number. This number can then be taken to a mobile phone provider and used under Section 1601 of Bill C-30 to obtain your name, address, and internet protocol number. In other words, you, the cell phone subscriber, can find your information sent to police and entered into a police database. And because of Section 23 of Bill C-30, the telecommunications service provider would be prohibited from disclosing to a subscriber that his or her basic subscriber information has been submitted upon request to a law enforcement agency. As Christopher Parson has concluded, therefore, and I quote, the capacity to acquire IMSI numbers en masse combined with legal powers to compel subscriber information creates the perfect framework for mass phishing expeditions based on where citizens are physically present. Now, some might, might say the police would never track people in this way, nor would they go to the next step of gathering information on people's friends and acquaintances. But the evidence confirms otherwise. In fact, at the Vancouver Olympics, people who were conducting legal actions in protest of the Games became the targets of a surveillance apparatus that followed their entries on web forums, even, through, even though disclosed memos obtained in the lead-up to the Olympics found that no specific credible threats existed. Furthermore, surveillance and intelligence gathering did not only focus on the citizens involved. According to Parsons, it focused on, quote, their contacts, friends, students, former partners, and academic and professional acquaintances. Efforts were made to recruit neighbors, friends, and acquaintances to spy on suspected activists. This concern about Bill C-30 opening the door further to the state being able to track protesters who are legally voicing their views in a democracy was the motivation and the essence of my question to the public safety minister on February 14th when the minister, through his answer, triggered a national firestorm by his disproportionate answer to that question. Proponents of expanding the surveillance powers through the adoption of Bill C-30 claim that these powers would be used to investigate the most serious crimes only, but this is not what the experience in other countries shows. In other jurisdictions, similar powers have been used to investigate less serious offenses. According to Nestor Arellano, there is no shortage of research which indicates that implementation of an online surveillance regime in the European Union and the United States have been fraught with flaws, abuse, and costs, ultimately shouldered by Internet service providers, tasked by government to essentially snoop on their customers. More than 10 years ago, the United Kingdom passed the Regulation of Invest Investigatory Powers Act to extend law enforcement agencies' access to communication systems to help police battle crime and terrorist-related activities. Under a voluntary code of practice, ISPs retain data such as content of email servers, email server logs, IP addresses, SMS messages, and others from six to 12 months. Reports from the Inter Interception Commissioner, which provides a yearly assessment of interception of communication traffic, indicate that a growing number of interception errors are occurring. In 2007, there were 24 interception errors and breaches found, which the Commissioner deemed to be too high, according to uh, Mr. Parsons. How much time do I have left, Madam Speaker? Thank you. In 2009, there were 36 interception errors and breaches attributed to the General Communications Headquarters, the Secret Service, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the Serious Organized Crime Agency, the Scottish Government, the Metropolitan Police Counter Terrorism Command and National Technical Assistance Center. During that year, there were a total of 525,000 130 requests for communications data that resulted in 661 reported errors. A report released by the UK civil liberties group Big Brother Watch paints a troubling picture of how law enforcement agents handled data that passes through their hands. The organization found that between 2007 and 2010, 243 police officers and staff received criminal convictions for breaking the country's Data Protection Act. 98 police officers and staff were terminated for breaching the Data Protection Act. 904 police officers and staff were subjected to internal disciplinary procedures for breaching the Data Protection Act. 
In one notable case, no less than 208 officers and staff received legal caution for viewing computer records related to a high profile crime. In another, a staff member was dismissed for discussing police information on Facebook, Madam Speaker. Numerous others were found to have accessed criminal records and personal data for no obvious policing purposes. In the United States, the problem is more significant, according to Parsons, who says the country, quote, suffers from endemic inappropriate surveillance, end quote. He said the National Security Agency reportedly runs a warrantless wiretapping system with the assistance of major telecom providers such as AT&T. A large amount of the surveillance conducted by state and federal agencies go unreported. This leads me to my conclusion, Madam Speaker. Privacy is, a funda is fundamental in a healthy democracy. That is why our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms contains Section 8. Section 8 of the Charter provides everyone in Canada with protection against unreasonable search and seizure. This right provides Canadians with their primary source of constitutionally enforced privacy rights against unreasonable intrusion from the state. Typically, this protects personal information that can be obtained through searching someone in a pat-down or entering someone's property on surveillance. Why is privacy fundamental, Madam Speaker? Because if law-abiding citizens feel they are being spied on, they begin to withdraw from the normal activities of life, like expressing themselves freely and legitimately, including nowadays through digital communications. When they withdraw, the seed of fear grows, and whenever there is fear, there is potential for manipulation by those in charge. Those in charge, who understandably like their powerful position, will drift, perhaps unconsciously, toward using that power to accumulate even more power. They will always do so under the pretense that the additional power is being used for the good. Those same people in charge, at least the less discerning and perhaps more sincere ones, will believe in their hearts that the system of increased state power they are building is for the larger good. We hear from proponents of Bill C-30 that we must emulate other countries. But we are not Europe, we are not the United States. We have the most modern rights charter of any of these countries. We are highly evolved and often ahead of the pack when it comes to respect for individual liberties. As Parsons has said, there is no need for cross-jurisdictional envy in these matters. Thank you, Madam Speaker.